Who boy. About time I got to this set of games, huh? I was actually kind of surprised to see the amount of people requesting that I cover the GU series, or asking if I was planning to at all. Was there really that much of a doubt? I mean, I was gone for quite a while. But I did mention that I have a lot to say about the GU games, and boy, do I have a lot to say. So, Dot Hack GU, or in a more broad sense, Dot Hack Conglomerate. To give a quick explanation for what it is, it's the follow-up to Project.Hack, which consisted of the original .hack games and Sign, among a bunch of other things. That's pretty much all that really needs to be said. Conglomerate is a sequel, or part two, to the .hack franchise as a whole, consisting of the GU games, Roots, etc, etc. I'm kind of cutting the background and the development of the game short here because there's already a lot to go through within the universe itself. That also gives me a good chance to mention that the whole story and background of the Dot .hack series is sort of given in a weird, disconnected way. You can go through the GU games just fine on their own and understand everything perfectly, but a lot of details and backstory of events are given in different forms of media in a messy order. As a normal player going through all these things, you would generally gather all this information just fine. You'd go through the games and experience the story while also digging through the anime and extra discs to get little bits of information to keep in your head, slowly connecting things as they pop up. It's a little harder to actually put all this into a digestible video format, while keeping that suspense and feeling of discovery and revelation you get from experiencing the story firsthand. I'm gonna try my best to do that, I just wanted to give you guys a heads up to hold on to your butts. It's gonna be a messy ride. I think that's enough covering my own ass though, so without any further delays, let's jump in. We start off by logging into the game as an adept rogue named Haseo. Except if you played the original four games, you'd probably notice things are pretty different to what we remember. The fuck is an adept rogue? Well, don't worry, we'll get to all that. Before Haseo can do anything, he's called over by two other players that notice he's new, Asta and Yotan. They offer to show Haseo the ropes of the game. I guess after all these years, CC Corp hasn't thought to put in a tutorial at all still. I'm gonna hold off on talking about the gameplay for a little bit. We'll get to there, don't worry. After a lengthy explanation of the game, we make it to the end of the area, where an item is waiting for us. Except instead of getting the item and going on our merry way, we're instead surprised with a betrayal from the party. Asta and Yotin attack Haseo, dropping their friendly facade to explain that they were just leading him on to kill him later on, describing how much they love player killing, PKing for short. If you just wanted to kill Haseo from the start, why did you bother teaching him so much about the game? I mean, it's awful nice of you, but you really would have saved some time if you just went in for the kill at the very start. As Aseo dies, he sees Asta and Yotin get taken out by another player, Ovon, who welcomes him to the world. Welcome to the world, R2. It's, uh... It's a little different, if you couldn't tell. It's a game where people could do pretty much whatever they want, from setting up a merchant shop to being a psycho serial killer that goes on a murder spree. If you aren't a PKer, you're often the one getting PK'd. As much as I'd love to explain more about what the hell happened to the old the world that we all know and love, we're gonna have to stop right here for a minute, cause it's time to talk about the anime. There's a time skip that happens right after the tutorial where we see Haseo looking... looking a little different. What happens between being saved by Ovon and that point is shown in the anime, Dot Hack Roots. It kind of bugs me that they laid things out like this, because I can't really tell who they're targeting in the anime. 
The anime explains and fleshes out things that the games barely cover, as if it's required backstory, so you'd think that it was made with the intent to watch it before playing the games. But the anime also spoils and outright explains some pretty big plot reveals from the games too. It tries to dance around and very coyly point at these surprises and spoilers, as if it's not outright telling you about the reveals. But it's like a kid trying to pretend he doesn't know about a prank that he wants you to know he did. Like I mentioned before, the anime starts right where the tutorial of the game ends, with Aseo coming back to town and meeting Ovon, along with the guild that Ovon runs called the Twilight Brigade. Well, Ovon's more like the leader in name only, with this girl, Shino, doing the actual leader work. The goal of the brigade is to find this item called the Key of the Twilight, which apparently lets them do whatever they want in the game. Or whatever they want, period? It's kind of vague on what it's supposed to do, because it doesn't really matter. Haseo joins the guild, though he does it more for the sake of learning more about Ovon and being close to Shino, whom he develops a bit of a crush on as the show goes on. He also does some digging on Ovon of his own, which leads into a cast of characters that are too wide with little relevance, so we're gonna cut the list down to a few people. Philo, as well as Ender, Naobi, and Tawariya from the Guild 10, an information selling guild, and Tabby, another member of the Twilight Brigade. Through his investigating, he finds out that Ovon's garnered a lot of attention because of his player model having a big weird cylinder attached to it, and also because of his charisma. Which I don't see at all. He's a very secretive guy, and almost every shot of him has him looking like this. Look at him! Would you be charmed by a guy that just casually talks like this? He's basically got a sign on him that says up to some bad shit. The anime really tends to drag on a lot of points, especially when it's focusing on the main characters. The first few episodes really wanted to hammer in that Haseo was special, having it repeated for a few episodes straight. Same with things like his attraction to Shino and the mystery around Ovon. We hardly ever see more than just the same general ideas without any progression in those ideas. Roots also waste the potential to do anything interesting with the concept of the whole anime taking place in an MMO. Instead of learning about these players as people and seeing them interact and learn from people with different lives outside of the game, it just focuses on the characters and their feelings without much or any information about the characters in terms of who they are outside of the game. The most fun I had while watching Roots was actually when the focus shifted for an episode to follow a side character helping out a starting merchant's guild, while struggling to compete against other merchants that were involved in real money trade. Not only did we learn about the character and see how their background helped the situation, but the situation itself was something unique to the concept of an MMO. The Twilight Brigade does their best to investigate possible clues regarding the Key of the Twilight, most of the clues bringing them to the Lost Grounds, locations in the world are two that have been around since the old days of Fragment. They also investigate spots that have these marks in the graphics of the game, called Signs by Tawaraya. Weird things happen to them when they try to interact with the signs, like phasing into them, moving through the boundaries of the game, and even teleporting. Eventually, their investigations lead them to a specific lost ground, where they believe the key of Twilight resides, behind a giant door. Before they can actually get access to the key, they're attacked by Tan and their Black Ops unit, claiming they want the key for themselves. Ovon manages to escape through the door while the rest of the guild fights off Tan, but it turns out that it was all a trap set up by Naobi to capture Ovon and dig into his player data, which was the real goal of Tan all along. Once Ovon gets captured, the whole raid just sort of… ends. Everyone goes home, and to the rest of the Twilight Brigade, Ovon just disappears. The next giant chunk of the show is a lot of Shino being sad and worried about Ovon, and Haseo going in to check on Shino while she uses him as a replacement for Ovon. Ovon actually escapes his entrapment when Naobi tries to open the cylinder on his arm, causing the server to crash and to serve as an opening for Ovon to escape. Shino also suspects that Tan had Ovon captured the entire time, and in response, reports Tan for using a special Black Ops division that was made to perform specific PKing tasks, which is against the game's user agreements. Can we talk about that for a second? Tan had a division called the Black Ops division. For a fucking MMO. Naobi and Ender both take this chance to switch over to their actual characters, Yada and Pai. More on them later. After enough time sulking, Shino finally gets contacted by Ovon, requesting that she meet him in the cathedral. Haseo also hears where she's going, but when he goes into the cathedral, he witnesses something that… sort of breaks him. Shino's body, limp, on the floor with a zombie-like figure standing over her, staring at her blankly. Yes, yes, those of us who know about the original games already know who this person looks like, but shh, be patient, it's okay, we'll get there, I promise. Haseo tries to contact Shino in the real world, but only ends up with the bad news that she'd become a lost one. Someone that had fallen into a coma soon after suffering death from a player killer named Triedge. He swears to kill Triedge, unclear if it's out of sheer rage or hopes that Shino will come back. This quickly becomes an obsession, causing close friends like Tabby and Philo to worry. Oh, shit, right, there's Philo. Um, okay, uh... 
So, Philo is an old man that just sort of hangs out in town all day. He was one of the first people that Haseo ever met in the world of R2. He's sort of been around just to give everyone advice and wisdom when they need it. After Ovan escaped, even he approached Philo, explaining everything to him. Philo promises to take Ovan's secret to the grave, and soon enough he gets attacked by Triage as well, though he manages to survive the attack. Philo sets a bit of time aside to kick Haseo's ass and tell him that he has no chance of beating Triage at his current strength. This doesn't actually do anything to help Aseo's mental health. In fact, it sets him down a further path of obsession, believing all he needs to do is level up and then kill Triage. Sadly, before he could do anything else to help Aseo, Philo passes away, a victim of terminal cancer that he hid from everyone the entire time. He did leave one last message for Aseo though. Stick to your guns. Faith will always win, no matter what. Alright, let's wrap this up already. We have a whole game to cover still. Jesus Christ. An event starts up at some point called the Forest of Pain, where players could enter a large dungeon with strong monsters that would hunt them endlessly. Haseo sees this as an opportunity to level up and prove his strength, though it mostly just shows his declining mental health. By the time the event ends, only two players are able to make it to the end. A strong player named Taihaku and Haseo. They both find a weird, strange room waiting for them, along with a voice that asks them about its daughter. I think we could safely assume this is another Herald AI, though we don't ever actually find out about this. Taihaku answers respectfully and is rewarded a strong weapon. Haseo answers like a little shit, and he's rewarded a giant level skip and two class advancements. I think Taihaku got a bit of a short stick here. The level jump and class changes are exactly what Haseo needed, letting him go on a massive PK killing spree where he hunts down player killers in hopes that one will know where to find Triage. This ends up pissing off every PKer in the game, big surprise, and they all gather around one area to set up a trap for Haseo, where they all gang up on him. Haseo ends up killing every single one, just furthering his reputation as a player killer... killer. That will never roll off the tongue well. Anyways, after the failed raid, rumors start up about him, with people dubbing him as Haseo, the Terror of Death. Oh yeah, Tabby was there during the raid too and she helped Haseo, but she's not really that important. It's a shame that I had to gloss over her for the sake of time because she's probably the best character in the show, in my opinion, but she doesn't actually do anything, which is sort of the point. Her whole deal is that she suffers from an intense clinical depression and takes medication while forcing herself to pep up and push herself into other people's problems to try and help. But this only ends up doing nothing at best or causes things to get worse in the worst case scenario, which causes her to reassess herself and think about what she wants to do, along with her own personal problems and her tendency to push them back, using other people as a distraction. By the end of the show, she leaves the game, enrolling in a nursing school so that she could take care of Shino while Haseo works on saving her. Sort of a flawed plan because last I checked, nursing school takes actual years while the story of GU takes maybe a few months at most. But we're just gonna let her go off and do that, I guess. And that's the end of Roots. Well, kinda. There's more to the show that I've glossed over, but a lot of it either means nothing, is shown in the games, doesn't really have much substance, or is an outright spoiler to the games. I can't even recommend checking the show out to maybe gather your own opinion, because of the huge story spoilers the show has for later on. You're not exactly missing much either, it's really best to just gloss over and move on. Speaking of... We pick up right in the middle of Haseo's rampage with him taking down a group of PKers. This group including a PKer named Bordeaux, a renowned PKer within the game. So, you think you can go up against me, the great Bordeaux, and just walk away like nothing happened? <laughs> Jesus Christ, Haseo, what the fuck? When that PK hunt proves to be fruitless, Haseo makes it back to town, where he's approached by a player named Sakaki from the Moontree Guild, a guild dedicated to helping players and stopping PKers. This also includes player killer killers, meaning Sakaki isn't too fond of Haseo either, and the two have a bit of an argument that ends when another Moontree member, Adelie, appears, surprising Haseo with how similar she looks to Shino. Before anything else could happen, Ovan shows up off the corner of Haseo's eye and leads him into an alley, where he informs Haseo that Triage will be waiting for him at the scene of the crime, the Hule Grands Cathedral. Haseo bolts it over there and finally sees Triage, immediately going in for an attack. Unfortunately, it doesn't exactly go well. <laughs> to put it lightly. Triage finishes off humiliating Haseo by pulling out a familiar move that we should all know well enough, Data Drain. One thing I really like is the little touch of making Haseo's Data Drain identical to when Kite was about to get Data Drained by Scathe in the original games. Almost like an ironic echo too, but we'll get there. 
The data drain reformats Aseo's whole system, booting him from the game at the same time. When he gets back on, he finds out that everything he had before the drain was wiped, including his emails from Shino, which probably actually hurt pretty bad. Worse still, when he gets back into the world, he sees that his character is all the way down to level 1, with no class advancements, weapons, or anything. It's like he's starting the game for the first time all over again. Though in my opinion, the worst part about all this is the hour of messages and forum posts that he has to catch up on. Before you even get a chance to jump into the game again, the game just bombards you with notifications from every single type of message board you can come across. In the original quadrilogy, there were only two places to keep track of news and forum posts. In the GU series, you not only have the news out Outlet, which has its own videos to play, but you also have the game's website itself with a bunch of lore about the world, you have the World R2 forums, you have your mail, and you have the off-game forums, which are split into five separate forums. I don't even mind the idea of having this much world building, both in-game and out. I really like the idea of having so many outlets to give you news and info about two different kinds of worlds, but oh my god do they go overboard at the start. I wasn't exaggerating when I said an hour of forum posts. It took me literally an hour to get through all of these posts. A lot of the news outlets don't even matter much because they say generally the same stuff that could be settled with one post. Technology is really advanced and most of the world depends on it now. Boy, I sure hope nothing bad happens to it. The only part of the news that matters much beyond the statement about technology is the online jack entry. Online jack is a little 5 minute sideshow that updates periodically, following a man named Salvador Aihara as he investigates an illness called Doll Syndrome. A condition spread amongst preschoolers and middle schoolers where they're left completely unresponsive. Think of Online Jack as GU's version of liminality, except the main character is like, way less charming. Salvador is actually a pretty big creep, which makes most of these reports pretty hard to watch without rolling my eyes and tuning out. Trucking through it though, all we find out is that Doll Syndrome seems to be related to online games and that's pretty much it. After that we have the offline forums where they talk about technology, rumors about the real world and the offline world, news, the world, and also this card game called Crimson Versus. They actually go as far as to explain how to play Crimson Versus right at the start of the game, when Crimson Versus isn't actually available to play. In fact, it won't be available to play until the second volume of GU. What the fuck is the point of explaining how to play it now? Then we have the direct forums of the world R2, but there's not much there right now aside from repeated tutorials. The actual interesting part of all this is the lore that the world's website offers. It's a really detailed rundown of the history of the world R2 and the backstories behind the races, areas, and classes. And yeah, there's even an explanation for what the classes are and what they do on the website too. Given not much of this information actually matters because GU is about the world the MMO rather than the world of the world R2 itself. Oh god, my head hurts. But it's still interesting that they went as far as to do this. And the art on here is amazing too. It really gives me like Yoshitaka Amano classic Final Fantasy vibes. Once we finally get into the game, Haseo has a little freak out about his progress being gone, before he spots Ovon in the distance being... Ovon. So he gives chase, but he has a little run in with Bordeaux, noticing that she's pretty pissed about dying to him earlier, and he's in no shape to actually fight her. I don't really know why he's afraid to run into her though. You can't start fights in towns as far as I know. Well, while he avoided Bordeaux's Ooh. posse, he has another run in with a much nicer duo. Gaspard and Syllabus, two members of the guild called Canard, built around helping new players. They notice that Haseo is level 1 and take him for a newbie, and when he tries to explain that he's actually Haseo the Terror of Death, they mistake him for a role player. Which is odd, if he was a newbie, how would he know about Haseo? Anyway, they sort of drag Haseo along to an area where they run him through a tutorial again, but this time he cuts them off short, until they actually teach him something new. Oh man, I could actually start talking about the game now. So GU is pretty obviously different from the original games in terms of gameplay. Things aren't nearly as stiff or menu based, in fact you're pretty much only going to be using the skill trigger system when you're using your skills now, which lets you use any skill you know that you mapped out to your controller's buttons, and then puts you on a short cooldown. Once that cooldown is over, you can use your skill again. Simple, right? You also have a lot more things you could just do now, rather than just stand there and whack at the enemy until they die. You could combo them, block, and even charge up an attack. You still got your items too, and those are on a cooldown as well, so hey, you can't spam healing items anymore. Great! All this comes at the cost of a more direct control of your party members though. Your party members only have a few behaviors you could choose from, and it just controls how aggressive or supportive they are. I found myself missing the amount of control I had over my party in the original games. It felt like I had a lot more to think about, and even more options to control the tide of battle. Then again, you don't really need that amount of control for this game. Things 
aren't that tough at all, and that's really disappointing to me. The game gives you plenty of experience when you finish a battle, and because of that, even when you're overleveled for an area, you're probably gonna level up at least once during a run, which makes even more areas an even bigger cakewalk. I do so much damage with just one combo, but an enemy could hit me with a barrage and it'll do jack all. I like the feeling of getting caught in a combo because it feels punishing, but then when I notice that I'm not actually losing much health, the impact of the whole fight just sort of falls off. I'm not against easy games either, I enjoy a nice relaxing experience from time to time. But being sent to so many areas just for leveling up and rewards that you really don't need really wears on you after a while and the whole game starts feeling tedious. I wasn't picking and choosing my battles because I was worried about resources or danger, I was outright avoiding battles because I was just tired of these fights. What makes that feeling worse is the fact that there is a cheat mode in Last Recode that you could select if you're just in for the story. It brings all your damage and HP to max, making it literally impossible to lose. I am okay with the existence of this sort of mode in general, but the fact that the base game barely takes any effort makes it feel like they should have added a higher difficulty setting to make the game more interesting to play. I can't confirm this at all either, but I've heard that they also made the experience gain higher in Last Recode along with the enemy damage a lot lower. There was a point where the game tried to teach me how to do something called Rengeki, basically an opening to do a skill and have it do more damage. It feels really cool, and it feeds your awakening meter which lets you do a special team attack after you fill it up enough. But when the game tried to teach me about Rengeki, the enemy died too fast to actually let me get an opening, because the game leveled me up too much for the enemy. And at this point, I've only been to areas the main story told me to go to. That should say just how wonky the balancing is in this game. After the second tutorial, Haseo and his group reach the end of the dungeon, collecting the rewards only to be interrupted by Bordeaux, who immediately recognized Haseo. Syllabus and Gaspard realize that Haseo isn't a roleplayer, no shit, and the trio proceeds to get bodied by Bordeaux, with something starting to wake up inside Haseo. The group is saved by Pi, coming in with a threat to call Moon Tree over. By now you've probably noticed that PKing is a pretty serious dilemma, and it brings one of the most frequently asked questions I've seen. And it's always pretty hard to answer it in my opinion. Why is player killing treated so seriously? I mean, look at the way Bordeaux, Asta, and Iyoten talk about it. They treat it like actual murder, and they react like actual psychopaths that love the feeling of murdering another person. When someone gets attacked, they sound like they're in real terror. And when people talk about being PK, they sound like they're actually reliving a traumatic experience. It's all a bit melodramatic, isn't it? Best way I could answer is, yeah, it is pretty melodramatic. And it's taken a little bit too seriously, especially later on in the game. The best reason I can give as to why that's the case is that they're all seeing this in a possibly first person direct view thanks to the technology of the game. And that gives them the full experience of murdering or being murdered. What bothers me more is the fact that I can't really tell how this works in the game, or how this would ever work in a game at all. Apparently player killing is such a rampant problem that CC Corp doesn't know how to deal with, that they made a whole bounty hunting system and arena to fix it. But those didn't do anything to really help the player killing problem. So why not just make specific servers that enable player killing? There's enough people that do it where people will fight each other, and other players that don't like player killing can just stay out of it. Go all runescape on the game, it'll be fine. Not only that, but what exactly are the repercussions to getting player killed? Yeah, sure, being stabbed in a way that feels realistic is pretty awful, but it doesn't seem like you really lose anything at all. You could save your game and just reload and you'll be fine. Even then, what are the benefits to PKing? Experience? Back in Roots, there was a mention of stealing items by player killing someone, but again, that person could just reload. Won't they just get their items back? Can you even steal items at all? It all sort of falls apart when you actually try to think of player killing in an actual game's perspective. When it's clear that the games just really want you to think of PKing as actual murder and PKers just do it for the sake of murdering. And it makes some high tension moments lose that tension. Haseo thanks Pi for saving the group in the most douchebag protagonist way possible, and explains to Syllabus and Gaspard everything that's happened to him. Before she leaves, Pi also tells Haseo that he has a dangerous power inside of his character, as if that wasn't said a million times already in Roots. The group decides to leave before any more player killers come back, and the two recommend that Haseo contact Moontree to get help with any more PKers. Haseo says fuck Moontree and their nerdy ass motto, and Adelie just so happens to recognize Haseo by his smart ass attitude and lectures him on what Moontree is really about, having a bit of a freak out on top of that. Do you get it? Do you understand? Do you Haseo? Uh. She forces her member address onto Haseo and offers him a more detailed explanation later on, and then everyone just sort of leaves Haseo alone to go check on his email. This is around the time we get emails from party members that affect their affection. Like the original games, you have email chains that let you learn about party members more, along with an affection rating that determines when you get these emails too. 
Instead of just getting an area code from your party members to have little events with them though, you have actual quests that you get from NPCs. In the overall everything of the game, these NPCs don't really matter, but they do provide a bit of detail to the world R2, which I can appreciate. Emails are also a lot more dependent on where you are in the story of the game too, with people actually referencing things that happen in the main story within the emails. There's also an extra way to get more info about them, with these little greeting cards that have different topics. And every greeting card has its own comment chain with every character. Oh boy, I could actually talk about something I like in this game. I really like the way you interact and see more of your party members in the GU series. You have the normal emails, you have quests that sometimes have pairs of characters with special dialogue, you have the greeting card chains that actually provide some fun knowledge and background of the characters, and you even have an address book that tells you more about the characters too. Nothing too deep, but fun little details to chuckle at. Nice stuff. While we're on the compliment train, I think I could take the time to actually talk about the music in the game too, which I absolutely love. There's some songs that are just perfect for the atmosphere of the game, and some very unique and beautiful. And this doesn't just go for the games. Roots also has an amazing soundtrack, even better than the games in my opinion. Oh, right. See, this is where I would play some music to show as an example, but unfortunately there's a super strict copyright on the game and anime soundtrack, so I can't play any of the music in risk of getting the whole video nuked. You'll just have to take my word for it or go out and look for the soundtrack yourself. Thanks, Victor Entertainment. After dealing with some emails, we get an offer from Syllabus to go on a quest with him and Gaspard. It's not really that much of an important quest, more like a tutorial on quests in general, so I'll take the time to talk about area codes instead. It works in a similar way to the original game's area codes. Pick three area words and get an area with different aspects. I like that there's a rating on NPCs, treasure, and levels this time. It would have been really nice if levels and treasure really mattered in this game. You can get enough area codes from the forums to never really need to explore any area words for yourself too. What bugs me is that a lot of these, as I've mentioned before, are just generic go here for levels areas instead of special events, and forum posts that talk about treasures usually lead you to some generic or semi-common items instead of special cool weapons. There have been so many posts that just tell you go here if you want armor that resists this specific element, which really doesn't matter. Enemies do barely any damage to begin with, you really don't need to pay attention to elemental values. Eventually, Adelie invites us to a little tour of an area where she can explain the goals and structure of Moon Tree. Mostly that the leadership is split between seven people, with one of those seven being the top leader, Sakaki being one of the seven council members. The tour is interrupted though when they find one of Triage's signs, with Adelie hearing a strange noise coming from it. The two are then transported to a new area where they see a very strange, very pretty man playing with some black spots. Adelie notices that the strange noise is actually coming from him, but before she could go and ask him anything, a monster appears and attacks the two, acting differently from a normal monster from the game. A new character, Kuhn, comes in to rescue them, summoning something he calls Magus to deal with it. All done. You two okay? Kuhn introduces himself as an investigator for CC Corp, and explains that what he used was called an avatar. The fact that Haseo could see the avatar is enough proof that he has the right properties to use one himself, echoing the words of Pi. He invites Haseo to his group's headquarters to learn more about basically everything, including Triage. And everyone heads back to town, with Adelie offering to go on a proper tour later on. We go on to meet Kuhn at his guild HQ. The guild Raven itself is more like a front for the headquarters of him and his fellow investigators, dubbing themselves GU based on a past CC Corp project. 
He invites us inside to meet the leader, Yada, at a room called the Serpent of Lore, which lets him monitor people within the game. And what follows is the most boring exposition I've heard in a long time. I love Stephen J. Blum, I think he's a great voice actor, but his voice for Yada is the most boring, monotone, sleep-inducing teacher's lecture I've ever heard. Every single time there's a meeting with Yada, I have to look back on the footage I recorded at least three times, because it's hard to pay attention to it all because of how boring it is. One of the effects, or perhaps I should say targets of that development, is that there are a variety of phenomena manifesting in the world. You yourself have experienced one of these developments, the forced reformatting of your character data. He explains that the weird black thing, along with the thing that attacked him and Adelie, is called an Ida, a phenomenon within the game that goes against the system's parameters. Triage is also something similar to this, meaning that he's likely an Ida as well. Whether he is or not, him, Ida, and the comatose victims seem to all have a connection, and GU is investigating that connection. Due to Haseo's special attributes, it'd mean that he'd be able to use an avatar like Kun did before, giving him a fighting chance against Ida and granting him the power he desperately wanted in order to fight Triad Edge. The special attributes within his character and computer dub him as a chosen one. We'll get to that soon, promise. Just hang on with me here. Haseo agrees to work with GU and leaves to await training and information from the group, though he isn't given much of a chance to do that when Gaspard comes up to him, panicking about his guild shop being understocked. When Haseo recommends to just buy the items, Gaspard asks Haseo to do it, while he goes off and… does something? I don't know, this is a pretty stupid moment, but it's Gaspard so I'm just leaving it as that. We gather the items and hand them over to Syllabus because Gaspard got lost in the middle of town. How? You have a map! And that leaves Aseo in charge of the guild shop while the two are gone. While he waits for them, a customer comes up to the shop, a young boy named Bo looking to buy an item as a birthday gift for his sister, who shares his account with him. Unfortunately, he doesn't have enough money for the item, but Haseo gives it to him anyway. Good job, Haseo, you failed at the one thing you were supposed to not do as a stand-in for a shop. Adelie catches Haseo in the act of being nice, and soon enough, Kuhn, Syllabus, and Gaspard also meet up with the two. Haseo catching Kuhn in the act of… well… being a womanizer. If you keep looking at me, with such a beautiful gaze like that, I just know that I'll be forever b b <clears throat> bound to you. We find out from Syllabus though that Kuhn was actually the guildmaster of Kennard, and really close to himself and Gaspard, but he had to leave the guild because of some personal issues. Those personal issues being his involvement with GU. We actually get to see the start of Kuhn's training with an avatar and him leaving Kennard in Roots. Kuhn books it out of there before Haseo could call him out, and Adelie rats out Haseo's good deed to Syllabus and Gaspard. Somehow, Gaspard and Syllabus think that good deed is enough to make Haseo the guildmaster of Canard. What? Where did that come from? You want the Terror of Death, a famous PKKer, as a guildmaster for a guild dedicated to newbies. Don't you think that might attract some bad attention? He's not even newbie friendly. In fact, he spent this whole conversation insulting everyone and saying he doesn't want to be a guildmaster. I actually feel kind of bad for him. They just ignore everything he's saying. It's like everyone's insane. This is a common thing, too. Haseo spends most of the game insulting or berating people or just telling people that he wants to be alone. And instead of, you know, doing the sensible thing of giving space to a guy that clearly needs it, they just ignore him and stay around. I actually don't have a problem with Haseo's attitude. I have a problem with how everyone else reacts to it. While the registration goes through, which, by the way, Haseo didn't even sign up for himself, he meets up with Kun and Pai to undergo some training in order to summon his avatar. Kun also goes into a little more detail on what exactly avatars are and what they could do. The current members of GU are called Epitaph users, characters created by CC Corp years ago for a certain project. What makes those characters special or what that project exactly was isn't known. Even Pi doesn't seem to know, or at least she stays quiet about it when asked. Epitaph users are able to summon beings called avatars that let them transform their characters using their powers of altering data, like how Triage data drained Haseo, which avatars can also do. Though Epitaph users are able to go beyond the parameters of the game, they still have restrictions and requirements to actually be able to summon their avatars, mostly around their links to their characters. Epitaph users have a special connection to their characters and avatars based on their will, emotions, and heart, meaning they're only able to summon their avatars when they're properly synced to their characters. That sure was a lot of info, right? Well, don't worry. Kun and Pai pretty much just boil it down to just fight stuff and see if you could summon it or something. That sure helps. Thanks, guys. <sighs> 
Surprise, surprise. That doesn't work and only ends with Haseo getting frustrated. Pai making things even worse by claiming it might be a lack of talent on Haseo's part. Even though Kun and Pai also mentioned that they summoned their avatars by complete accident, so not only was this training completely pointless, but Pai's words mean absolutely nothing either. Pai gives us a little warning at the end of the training, saying that if Haseo can't summon an avatar, he's completely useless to GU. But also that she's glad that he couldn't summon one, since there's a chance that avatars could go berserk. On top of that, Pai knows that Haseo intends to use his avatar casually in battle instead of carefully, which is another dangerous risk. Well, that added up to pretty much nothing. Let's get back to important stuff like... Oh god... Alright, so the Guildmaster registration finally goes through and Haseo gets to check out Kennard's base, where he meets... <sighs> Death Grunty. Why are they like this? Why did CC Corp go from these adorable dumbasses to things like this? It's not just Death Grunty either. Every Grunty from every guild has this annoying noise they make and they force you on this weird, pointless quest to meet all of them and they force themselves into the plot at the most annoying points in the game and oh my god these things suck! Like I mentioned before, Haseo has to go on this small quest to meet the other Gruntys before he's recognized as a proper guild master. And after that waste of time, we actually get some privileges of being a guild master that we could use as players. First is access to the guild shop where we could put up all our trash and get a pretty decent sum of cash from it. Even though money isn't really a big deal in this game. We also get access to alchemy where we can combine weapons together to make enhanced versions of those weapons. The book of Ryu where we get rewarded greeting cards and other goodies for progress in the game. And the steam bike. Oh god, this is probably the worst bike I've ever ridden in a game. The bike is just so stiff and it swerves and breaks at random points and holds the line you're driving in for way too long. It doesn't even feel that much faster than moving around on foot. The game gets an update soon after with a new route town available. Lumina Cloth, the home of the arena where players could fight each other to their heart's content. The arena is split into three different cups or palaces. Demon, Holy, and Sage with the champion or emperor being at the top of each palace. Haseo and the rest of Canard end up going to spectate on the latest fight of the Demon Palace's emperor, Endrance. Turns out, Endrance happens to be a familiar face to Haseo. Even more interesting though is when Endrance starts to fight his opponents and what he uses. <laughs> Is that? Hmm? What's the matter? Can't you see that? Can't you? <laughs> Avatar. Haseo immediately recognizes Endrance as an Epitaph user, confused as to why an Epitaph user would be hanging out with Ida like Endrance was earlier. Before he could think too much on it though, he spots Ovan being a mysterious prick as usual and gives chase. Here's how that conversation goes. So you got wrecked by Triedge. Ha <laughs> ha Anyways, go fight Endrance. And that's it. Haseo's thoughts are interrupted by the shrill shrieks coming from Bo. Well, it looks like Bo at first, but we're actually talking to Saku, Bo's significantly worse twin sister, who also doubles as Endrance's fangirl. She mocks Haseo a bit for not being Endrance, and then Endrance uses Ida to teleport into the area. Haseo calls out both the Ida and his avatar powers, to which Endrance replies by saying even though Haseo can see avatars, he's still a weakling with no real power. Haseo responds in the most Haseo way possible, by spontaneously deciding to fight Endrance in the arena, which means he'll need to sign up for the Demon Palace tournament, which also means he'll need a team. Syllabus offers his help, but Gaspard chickens out, leaving the team to look for someone that could heal during battle. Adelie immediately comes to mind, though Haseo's reluctant to invite her, because Adelie is... well... Adelie. Still, Haseo joins her on another date, with the intent to butter her up to join the tournament. During the date, Adelie talks about how important the world and its story and concept is, as well as the beings that live within the world. How it's not just computer data, but feelings and emotions that connect the players and the game together. There's beings that live in the world that have emotions that are real to them, and hurting them is just like hurting a real living thing. 
She also mentions that it's important to open up to the people of the world. Be kind to people to connect with people. Sakaki is the person that she could open up to, while Haseo is a little more reluctant to give away who he's willing to open up to. When the two finally finish up the area, Haseo brings up the idea of the arena to Adelie. She basically dunks on the arena, saying that she doesn't get why people want to be stronger and want to get better and be better than others, mostly because she had one experience where she came at dead last. Even though she was just talking about respecting, being kind, and opening up to others, meaning being able to accept other people's way of playing. I get what Adelie is saying, but the way she preaches it just comes off as her way is the only way to enjoy the game. It's annoying. Haseo doesn't take it well either. <laughs> it's impossible! I can't take this anymore! All of this! All of this! is nothing more than a bunch of computer data! Leave. Huh? Damn, you're so irritating! Don't show your face again! So, Adelie isn't an option anymore, and Kennard has left no choice but to put up a listing on the game's forums. They get a response back pretty fast, with someone requesting that Haseo meet them at the end of a dungeon with no one else around. Haseo sees absolutely no problem with this, and goes over and whoops, what do you know, it's a trap. Bordeaux was hired by Saku to PK Haseo for considering joining the arena. Okay, and then what? Seriously, what was Saku's plan after that? What would PK Haseo do? Like, okay, let's assume this works out. Bordeaux kills Haseo, and then Haseo... respawns, goes back to looking for a third person, and joins the arena anyway. What would Peking even accomplish? We established you could just respawn, and you could just reload your game, so what's the threat here? Oh, yeah, nothing really comes of this whole thing anyway. Sakaki arrives before Bordeaux could do anything, along with another Moon Tree Council member, Matsu. Turns out that Bo told Adelie what Saku did, and Adelie quickly called up Moontree to help Haseo. Adelie also apologizes for trying to push Moontree and her own ideals onto Haseo, and offers to join him in the arena after all. Not only to help, but to also see what winning feels like. Maybe get some perspective. Alright, you know what? That's pretty good on Adelie. I appreciate that sort of development. Let's hope it lasts. With the team established, they go into the arena to register and have their first match, where we also get an explanation for how arena fights work. They're basically like normal fights, except when the leader of the party dies, the team loses immediately. You could also do variations of Rangekis in the arena called Hangekis, activated whenever you use a skill on somebody that's about to use a skill. The whole leader death rule is pretty lame in my opinion. I only ever targeted the leader, and hey look, the match was done in like seconds. I haven't mentioned a lot of side content for this game, have I? Partly because there's just so much story to go through, but also because there's not that much interesting stuff when it comes to side content. A lot of the quests you get at first revolve around the world's NPCs, which would be interesting if they weren't all these weird blob guys that pretty much only exist inside their quests and the little tasks they give you outside of it. You still get side stories with your actual party members, but this isn't until much later into the game. But this is pretty much the best point until the end and post game when we're actually allowed to do whatever we want. Up until now, the game really limits you on your party setup, and it feels like they just want you to go wherever the story wants you to go. Given a good chunk of this feeling is mostly because your party roster is limited to like, five people in the first game, and they do have their own lives. The main task right now is to build up our arena rank to the top 16 so that we could take part in the tournament. This just involves a lot of arena fights, and not a lot of it is very demanding of your attention. A few fights gave me a bit of a workout, but there really isn't that much excitement here. Mostly because they end so damn quickly and the game overlevels you to hell and back. During the arena marathon, Haseo runs into Gaspard who's looking surprisingly down, but waves it off after noticing the leader of GU directly challenging Triedge at the Hule Grands Cathedral. Thinking Yada has gone insane, Haseo runs over there only to meet... Oh god, not you. Yes, Pyrrhos is back. Now called Pyrrhos III, but this is most certainly the same Pyrrhos from the original games. Now actually a graphical designer for the world. He's pissed off because of all the signs Triage made on the world, challenging him as the leader of his guild named G.U. That's graphics unbelievable! Just so you know. At first, he thinks Haseo is Triage, but after a brief explanation, Pyrrhos forces his friendship onto Haseo as a fellow enemy of Triage, gives him his member address, and leaves. 
Yeah, that sounds about right. After we rank up a bit, Haseo gets called out by a random dude outside the arena named Antares. Hey, you little twat sniffing turd hoofer. So you really think you're hot shit just because you can swing your puny swords around? Well, I have news for you, buddy. You're actually a big punk baby bitch. It's time to fucking get some gains and train you up with a special dungeon. You are in for an ass whooping you have never felt before because your mother was too busy snorting cheese nips. But don't worry, I will take her place, and give you the ass dunking that you deserve so you stop being a moody sack of hormones and edgy designs. I will be like the mother you never had wished you never had but that you need to grow into a decent human being that you can be at least a little proud of. Now come suckle on my teat of training. The dungeon that Antiris assigns us to is a weird teleporting puzzle dungeon, and he just sorta just messages us the answer. It's not even a hard puzzle, it's just a spiral, and you could easily just reveal the whole map and solve it yourself. I don't get what the challenge here was supposed to be. And here it just says, Good job my little baby bird son. You have made me a proud mama bird this day. But like every newborn hatchling you must wean off the teats of your mother and be thrown out into the wild where you must learn to walk on your own two tiny bird feet. Good luck my little baby yoke. And teleports away. After we finally rank up enough to take part in the tournament, Saku comes in to say <laughs> and we're sent off to meet with Gaspard and see what's upsetting him. It turns out that the PKers that always harass us have now been harassing Gaspard by attacking whoever shops at the guild shop, effectively killing off his entire customer base. How this isn't against the terms of service, yet having an entire PKing strike force is against the terms of service is beyond me. Gaspard has a bit of a breakdown because of all this bullying, saying this isn't why he plays the world and this isn't fun for him anymore. And all of this would be really touching if they didn't give Gaspard the dumbest, most exaggerated voice possible. The world that I know of is one in which everyone is happy and smiling all the time. Anyway, Kun and Haseo opt to go to the HQ of Bordeaux's guild, Kestrel, to talk to her guildmaster. A real talk to your bully's parents approach. They even call it bullying too. Even the PKers actually call it bullying and they sound like they take pride in it. How are we supposed to take any of this seriously if they all act like bad cartoon characters? We get a good look at Kestrel now and their very Darwinian, Roman approach to all things. Even making their HQ like a coliseum. It seems like everyone in Kestrel is a PKer. And go by the laws that if you're strong enough, you should do whatever you want and if someone doesn't like it, they should stop you. That's the way of the world, the way of Kestrel, and the way of Gabi, the guild leader. Gabi appears before Kun and Haseo, Kun being the one to call him out since Gabi and him are old friends. Kun actually used to be a member of Kestrel, until it started to head into a direction that he didn't approve of. They have a bit of a spat, with Gabi just being an all around fun, stupid guy. I love him, genuinely. He's just a big strong idiot that doesn't care about anything. It's almost like he's the only one that still remembers that they're all playing a video game. While Gabi refuses to do anything to stop the bullying, he does press that he hates boredom. And if Bordeaux continues to just bully to the point of things getting boring, he won't tolerate it. Bordeaux proposes a deal then. She and Haseo happen to be against each other in the first Demon Palace tournament match. If Haseo wins, she'll stop bullying Kennard. She does this while making a promise to Gabi that she'll win. If she doesn't, she'll get kicked from Kestrel. Bordeaux! Yes? A cornered beast like you are now is a very beautiful thing. <sighs> Thanks. You know, I know I just said I like Gabi, but that comment is a little creepy when you realize Bordeaux is 14. <coughs> Kennard makes plans to win the battle against Kestrel, but Kun tells Aseo in private that him and Paya are also in the tournament, as a task for GU. Endrance is an avatar user after all, and is interacting with Ida. They need to look into it themselves, and it's dangerous for Haseo to get involved, considering his lack of an avatar still. Haseo doesn't give in though. He still wants to fight, for the sake of Gaspard. He actually starts warming up to his friends, realizing that the world is more than just a game to them. Syllabus, take care of Gaspard. But enough of that sentimental bullshit. It's time for class advancements, hell yeah! 
I never talked about class as much in the original series, but that's because things were pretty straightforward. One general magic user, a few middle class jack of all trades, and a few heavy fighters. But in GU, the classes are much more different and much more varied. You got multiple types of magic users this time, with some being more offense or support oriented. A ranged fighter, more weapons, it feels like a full list of classes that you would see in an MMO. I like it. Haseo, however, is an adept rogue. A class that could swap weapons and change into multiple other classes, based on what they choose during character creation. The trade-off is that they aren't masters of those weapons, and don't get as many skills for those weapons as the pure classes, in exchange for huge versatility. The part that seems a little bullshit to me is that the Adept Rogue needs to do a specific job advancement quest for these class changes, and according to the forum, these quests are limited time only. Excuse me? Why? So if I happen to make an Adept Rogue after the limited time quest is over, I'm just screwed and stuck as a weaker version of one class until CC Corp decides to open the quest again? At first you think that Adept Rogues are a little broken, but no, it's more like Adept Rogues get the super short end of the stick. The quest itself, however, is simple. Get to the end of the dungeon. And look at that! This dungeon looks really familiar. I wonder if this is the same layout Antiris told us about earlier. Hmm... Okay, several questions. First, why is this dungeon a limited time event if there's already another area code with the exact same layout? Second, why did Antiris feel the need to train us with this dungeon? It's still straightforward, it's still just a spiral. There's no time limit, I would have gotten to the end even if I went with every single teleporter. I still have a map, guys. Third, if this is supposed to be our real test, why does the game feel the need to remind us of the answers Antiris gave us while we're doing the real test? It was like 10 minutes ago. It's not a long dungeon, I don't need someone to hold my hand this much. Whatever, we get our job advancement, and with it, we get some nice looking clothes too. Look at that. Look at those nice new kicks. All that gold on him, that nice strong look, that tail, ass, cape thing. Whatever. I really like this design. It's one of my favorite costumes on Haseo. No one really comments on Haseo's class changes or costumes. And that's totally fair since Haseo and the player are like the only people that would ever care. But I still would have liked someone to acknowledge the accomplishment. Tell me I'm pretty, damn it. Pay attention to my fashion! We don't just get a fashion upgrade with our advancement, though. Haseo also gets the ability to swap to heavy blades now. Heavy blades are exactly what you'd expect them to be. Heavy, slow, high damage, singular strikes with a pretty wide range. Pretty much opposite of the dual blades. So I'm glad this is the weapon you get to let the player feel like they have two completely different options for combat if one doesn't fit their style. And remember what I said about adept rogues seeming broken at first? Well the real broken class is actually edge punishers because these heavy blades have an exploit that is ridiculous. When you strike once, it does heavy damage. And the trade-off is that there's only three slow attacks in the combo. And the combo is really slow, leaving you open for damage when you try to get the full max combo off. You can bypass all of that by simply hitting the block button. Canceling the animation for your other attacks so you can immediately go into the first hit of your combo again. Chain one attack and a block together and congratulations! You've just won the game by repeatedly slashing every enemy in the dick for heavy damage at the speed of dual blades. Literally nothing can stop you now. So of course I use this the whole game, why wouldn't I? With a job extension in tow, Haseo's team registers themselves to fight Bordeaux, without Syllabus, who had to back out to take care of Gaspard. And you know what? The fight was pretty tough, and that's good. It actually gave me a run for my money and killed Adelie, taking out my healer and leaving me to fend for myself. Unfortunately, no matter how well you're doing, the fight gets interrupted by the story to tell you that Haseo's getting his ass kicked. Get, uh... Get ready for a lot of that. In the middle of Bordeaux gloating, Haseo has a breakdown, realizing that if he loses, he won't be able to protect or help anyone. In desperation, he tries to bring out his avatar one last time, finally succeeding when he catches a glimpse of Ovon. And what follows is a turning point for Haseo.
Ha, ha, ha.